talk about some things. So, how have you been lately? Have you had an opportunity to read that book I gave you? No. No. <laughs> no, not only have I read it, but I just started reading it again. Again? Yeah, again. Well, that means it's helped, been helpful in helping you to sort out some of your concerns. Quite a bit. Though I admit when you first gave it to me, I kind of had some concerns because it was such an old book. I thought, how can this be relevant to me in the 21st century? An old book, really? So that means you've given up on the scriptures, too, because they're just a little bit older than that book I gave you. Point well taken. Okay. <laughs> you know, I hadn't thought of that. But actually, reading this book has really helped me to read the Bible again, too. You know how it is as a pastor. You write sermons all the time. And you go into the Bible, and you go to read whatever passage it is you're going to preach on. And you kind of use it like a reference book. It becomes sort of the thing you use to write a term paper, right? But since I've been reading this book the last few weeks, the Bible has really changed for me. Now when I read it, I take out my journal and my pen to take some notes, and I read it out loud. Reading it out loud has been great, the way it probably was originally meant to be read. You know, it just sounds good. It sounds so much different than just reading it on a page. So you've discovered it really is the living word of God. Very much alive, in fact. And, and I, really, I really have a lot of trouble with that. It's really kind of uncomfortable for me. It's challenging, isn't it? That's very true because God can speak very directly through the written word. Yeah, he can. And it's moments like that that I feel like it's just me and God having a one-on-one, -on -one, heart to heart talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, my faith has been growing as a result of reading this book quite a lot. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it hasn't just been through my personal devotions. Yeah. Really, it's been through meeting with people mm -hmm. and listening to their problems and their concerns mm -hmm. and uh, challenging them to meet their challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's been very good for me. But, you know, Dad, when I first came out of seminary, I thought I had all the answers. I've been there. I've done that. And then things started to change. Okay. You know, I was the newsletter editor, and I was printing out bulletins and writing sermons and going to meetings, all those meetings. Right. And these are, there are things uh -huh. that I was doing that I was no good at. Mm -hmm. And I just did them while other people sat around and watched me. Okay. But the book helped me to take a good look at myself and see what was happening. And as I worked my way through it, I began to see that uh, God was calling me back to what I originally went to seminary for and what I originally wanted to become a pastor for. And I realized that it's not so much how I do things or how well I do them, right. but it's the kind of person I am right. and, and the people that God sends to me and how we work together. Okay. Let me get this straight. Are you saying it really isn't important what you do as a pastor? No, I wouldn't say that. Okay. What pastors do really does make a difference. Mm -hmm. But what I do, or what any follower of Jesus does for that matter, needs to come from the heart and the mind that's in tune with God's will. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've learned a lot more about what it means to be a pastor just by paying attention to other people over the last few weeks. Mm -hmm. Dad, you know, don't get me wrong. I love being a pastor, but what I've learned over the past few weeks is that what really counts is being able to see and hear what's going on in the world around me, you know, just to keep my eyes and my ears open and listen for God, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to think about God's word and God's scripture in my life, mm -hmm. and then to trust that God is going to lead me to those people that are in need of help. So you really are growing in faith. Yep. You know, it's like St. Paul says in the 12th chapter of Romans. I actually was just looking it up here on my uh, iPhone. I know what that right? is. Yeah. It's really a handy thing here. You right, know? yeah. So, uh, <laughs> um, you know that passage called The Message? Mm -hmm. Let me read it for you because I about, really... It's about not being conformed but transformed, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that one. I'm going to read it because this really is a fantastic passage. Mm -hmm. And it's really been something I've been coming back to a lot over please, the past few please. weeks. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life 
your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Right. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. You know what that sounds like to me, Chris? It sounds like you're describing your personal journey of faith. Well, that's what I meant when I said that sometimes I feel like God is speaking to me through the scripture. Mm -hmm. when I and he's it. speaking to me as well. You know, I've got something to tell you about retired pastors. Uh-oh. Retired pastors uh, have to be serious about their lives, too. They still have a lot of energy and enthusiasm to give. You see, Chris, you can retire as a pastor, but you're always a disciple of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the three Korean guys, right, they taught us uh. Hey, you two, would you like to join us? We're going over to Casa Maria for some pizza. Sure, Tom. You know, Dad and I were just having a chat, and that made me hungry. Chris! And I could really use some supper fellowship. What about you? You never used to like pizza when you were a kid. Well, I've grown up a lot since then, and, well, I have a lot to celebrate, you know? So why not have some fun? I'm good for it. Let's go. Okay. Yeah, and don't worry. Oh. You'll love this place. You know what? They use oh, yes, we want to take this one. I can't yeah. believe you can eat that too, Pam. Oh. Oh. Why roll the cornball jokes then? Oh, delicious. Never. <laughs> so, what do you think about the story? I must admit, it can't be compared to Don Bunyan's classic, A Pilgrim's, A Pilgrim's Cry of Progress. But in the end, Pastor Chris Everman doesn't arrive at the Celestial City, but that's okay, because the story is her story, the story of a pastor searching for her own soul and having it given back to her. Perhaps you should think of this as sort of a love story. Now, there's no romantic attachment involved in this tale, but it's still about love, the love that of God's share and caring for those who are seeking the meaning of their lives and the lives and love that God's Spirit gives to people who are willing to take steps of faith to lead them into God's future. What is it that God really expects of those who follow his pathway? His goal is not that we live perfect or blameless lives, totally free from the stain of sin. God's goal is simply, as Jesus himself said, when somebody asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? God wants us to love him, to passionately love him with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. To have the same passionate commitment towards our neighbors for the sake of the world because God's kingdom is a reign of love. The love for us and our love in return. Pastor Chris, like so many others who start to follow after Jesus, lose sight of God's goal. But by God's grace, God brought her back to her first love. And she was able to discover again the peace of God, which passes all human understanding. You know, her story is our story. 